we will begin before the beginning in the middle or at the end, the very ends of beginnings, at any point really. In considering philosophy, the exquisite polyphonic practice par excellence, invoking doubles, that which we may call duplicitous, why, uh, duplicity, why not, of double inscriptions in relation to Freud, the conscious and the unconscious, and recall, recalling loose Irigaray's philosophy of the two, to be two, uh, notwithstanding uh, Giorgio Agamben's singular plural, that is to say, I'm taking our chances, marking an inversion, that is calling upon the inversion that is of philosophy and or fiction, art and or philosophy, and so too calling fidelity to infidelity. I have mentioned earlier. When we consider philosophy as a radical form of fiction and fiction as a radical form of philosophy, in which we consider the philosopher in the tradition of the Greek, of the Greek rhapsode, the philosopher performing a song, whispering a text, composing a symphony, not unlike Beethoven's fifth or ninth, some of my favorites, or a flamenco song. In the sense of a Foucauldian notion of the text as a discursive practice, this is from um, his text, What is an Author, from 1969 in a practice that amplifies itself and calls forth <coughs> its infinite extension, deliberation, interpretation, or let us say, referring to Roland Barthes, uh, his essay, Death of the Author, 1968, as a site of endless quotations. The space of literature, here, a nod towards Maurice Blanchot. We're not going to talk about him, but... <coughs> uh, ...has become the space of philosophy and thus entered into the space of an infinite conversation. <coughs> so, the whole idea of philosophy uh, in relation to uh, the rhapsode and the song uh, <coughs> is also something that I'd like to sort of consider uh, in reference to, to the philosophic text uh, in relation to fiction and storytelling, singing, um, uh, so draw that line uh, towards philosophy. And um, and uh, the term rhapsode is derived from rhapsodine, um, Greek meaning uh, to sow. Songs to throw <coughs> songs together. So um, this is something also to keep in mind when, when when you're reading or writing a text or you're composing music or you're drawing or you're writing a poem. Uh, this whole idea of of um, sewing together uh, songs and. Um, And uh, the reference from the, the rhapsode, uh, also another reference to uh, Sanskrit uh, and sutra meaning uh, stitched verse. There's all these interconnections, um, east, both east and west. Um, uh, sutra meaning uh, a thread or line that holds things together. Hmm. And in Buddhism, the sutra refers to mostly canonical scriptures, 
So there you go again, um, this whole relationship to the sacred, uh, the, the song and the storytelling uh, that I'd like to draw towards, you know, contemporary continental philosophy. So there was also some talk about uh, sutra uh, being a kind of um, misnomer of uh, um, another language called uh, Prakrit or Pali, which is a Middle Indo-Aryan language, uh, where sutta is uh, means well spoken and good news uh, related to um, uh, uh, Buddha himself refers to a speech in his first sermon uh, um, this relationship of, of the well spoken and the good news so uh, you know Wolfgang Schumacher always asks everyone hey guys Where's the good news? It's all bad news. <laughs> like the Buddha himself. So, uh, I thought that was, uh, was interesting. So, okay, so this um, reference to um, sacred and secular texts and song um, uh, of course, also leads us to some notion of hermeneutics and exegesis. Um, and so, what I'd like to do uh, when we refer to um, philosophical texts, uh, uh, for example, when we will um, read Hegel, not so much with Kristeva, but when we're reading Hegel, I'd like also to, to consider uh, the science of logic as a kind of, as a sacred text, mm. really, a contemporary secular sacred text. So there's a lot of talk of uh, interpretation also uh, in relation to um, to the readings, uh, the hermeneutics and so on, um, uh, to Christeva, but you know, uh, also this calls up uh, Susan Sontag's essay from 1964 call, um, called Against Interpretation. And so, what is interesting about this essay is, uh, you know, she's quite outraged. I don't know, are you familiar with this essay? I've heard a lot about it, but I've never read it. But, uh, just a few quotes from it I have here. She, she's, she writes, What is important now is to recover our senses. We must learn to see more, hear more, feel more. In place of a hermeneutics, we need an erotics of art. And um, so what, uh, what I was also referring to, uh, um, an erotics of, of philosophy, uh, we were speaking a little bit earlier about that in relation to a kind of seduction in the text and in relation to philosophy as the lover or beloved. And of course, uh, what comes immediately to mind is the Kama Sutra. <laughs> um, uh, which is uh, um, an ancient uh, Indian Hindu text widely considered to be the standard work on human sexual behavior in Sanskrit literature. Uh, 
But really, when I refer to philosophy as a form of seduction, it's it's not so much. Uh, mm, in the sense of the Kama Sutra, I, I, I see it more as, as uh, the text itself, and the desire for the text itself, right? So, um, in that sense, uh, uh, it's, it's not, not so related to the Kama Sutra, but, but I wanted to interject, nonetheless, um, this reference. Uh, maybe of a uh, combination of pleasure and uh, spirituality. And, mm, that is uh, evident in, 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 in the Kama Sutra as well. Okay, so when I, what I ran across a lot uh, was this relationship when I was speaking about, you know, this, there seems to be this in, in, intense opposition between sense and nonsense, art and, and philosophy, um, kind of uh, knowledge versus madness and so on. And even, you know, Susan Sontag in, in, in her essay, um, Mm. Well, not so. Um, there's an essay called On Style, um, and she makes a few comments. And so that's something that just for us to keep in mind. She writes, I'm not saying that a work of art creates a world which is entirely self-referring. Of course, works of art, uh, with the important exception of music, refer to the real world, to our knowledge, to our experience, to our values. They present information and evaluations, but their distinctive feature is that they give rise to not, rise not to conceptual knowledge. They give rise to it or they don't? Not. They do not give rise to conceptual So I would take, I would argue that. Wasn't that the classic sense of philosophy where the poetic language is outside of conceptual Yes, yes, this is totally, it goes throughout the, the whole shebang, the whole, from the very <coughs> beginning. And then, of course, the, the romantics, you know, they try to. Mm, displays that somewhere. Um, and they put it in shitter and so on. Mm -hmm. person of the poet, which right. right. Rather than the text. Yes. Right. Okay. So, so according to Sontag, uh, she says um, that they give rise not to conceptual knowledge which is the distinctive feature of discursive or scientific knowledge. In other words, philosophy, sociology, psychology, history. But to something like an excitation, a phenomenon of commitment, judgment in a state of thraldom or captivation. So in other words, philosophy, um, you know, and if we had Susan Sontag here, I'm sure she would argue her point brilliantly, and it would be very difficult to. But she might have changed her opinion. Right, so, you know, because I'm such a fan of her, it's difficult for me to. But nonetheless, I will take that, I will uh, argue this point. And so, in relation to philosophy, there should not be any excitation. Uh, no s phenom uh, phenomenon of commitment, judgment in a state of thraldom or captivation. Um, and later, if we we find the section, uh, you know, Kosteva also makes some point here about this separation between. Mm -hmm. 
art and science and philosophy and <coughs> So, but of course what we're interested in is a kind of overlappings and mm, exactly in, in, uh, in, in a kind of contrary position here of this point. And so what about something like Bataille? Right. So, what would you say? What would you say about Bataille? I mean, we want to apply, you know, he doesn't really talk about black language, or, uh, but, you know, we talk about his moments of sovereignty, or, or the, a general economy of, well, I mean, in fact, actually, sorry, some poets I've written about, I've taken my tie and applied his notions of the general economy to writing as a waste, um, excess, mm -hmm. surplus, orgasm, you know. Right. Yes, so I think Fatai would be a really good candidate to fall into the category of, of you know, uh, where these kinds of distinctions between art and knowledge or sense and nonsense break apart, right? And um, so, why do you call that another category? Why do we continue thinking in all these terms? What's another word? Space? Yeah, maybe space is more appropriate. But I think uh, one of the things that, um, you know, when you think about philosophy in relation to the poetic, uh, and you think of uh, such writers, such philosophers as uh, it's a Heidegger, you, you can think of Levinas, you know, Bataille, um, Derrida, you know, because there's this kind of this poetic sense, this literary sense of, of the language. Uh, and. Do you include Bakalar, maybe? Who? Poetics of Space? No. Mm. It's not well, I think, you know, one of the things that, that I, I'm trying to sort of argue here is um, it's not so much the particular philosopher, but rethinking, you know, how we read a particular language or a particular text. And so, uh, usually, when you speak about the poetic, uh, you know, there, there are uh, historically uh, certain philosophers that lend themselves to this kind of poetic language, right? Um, but what I'm trying to, uh, you know, argue um, or consider, let's say, is, is that um, someone like, uh, like Hegel, who himself you know, disparage this kind of uh, non-systematic form of knowledge, that in fact it is uh, this kind of language would, which also allows itself um, this possibility. So... Um, Can we look at some examples? Because that really intrigues me. Um, but that's, I mean, that's sort of the... Uh, that's what you're saying. It's like the what, where you want to go, and right. and uh, you know it's kind of really interesting because I mean the science of logic is wouldn't even necessarily be considered Hegel's poetic text, right? Exactly right. So the, in fact, I I picked the science of logic because the phenomenology is still you know the preface is very mm -hmm. uh, still there's this discussion of of maybe in some relation to the poetic sort of power of, of that text. Um, but uh, I wanted to sort of go a little elsewhere to it. Yes, and we will actually get to, to Hegel. We'll spend a lot of time with Hegel tomorrow. So um, we'll go through, you know, some of these examples. Um, 
mm, you know, starting tomorrow, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So it will fall more into place a little bit more of what, what I'm talking about today. Yeah. So, uh, I think that uh, also what, um, mm, what I'd like to um, consider is um, mm, this notion of, of uh, mm, Catherine Clement wrote a book called uh, The Sinkhole, The Philosophy of Rapture. What's the first word? S I N C O P E. Philosophy of Rapture. What about it? Oh, and the Roman Tales, second philosophy. I read that, I can't remember. Same quote. That's the name of the book. Philosophy of Rapture. I think potentially there are lots of things that are. Can I just ask a question about what you, conceptual knowledge? Um, I'm just thinking there's two possibilities here, and whether this distinction is valid. The first would be a knowledge about concepts and how you might want to arrange those concepts in any given system. And the other would be a knowledge about something else, non-conceptual, but you know it, or you try to know it through concepts. So, because my question is, poetry gives rise to, does not give rise to conceptual knowledge. It does give rise to something. Are we entitled, after ha it having been given rise to this non-conceptual world, can we use concepts to talk about it? Can we try to approach it through concepts? No. Yeah, what, what I would like to, um, you know, mm -hmm. consider is that, that uh, mm -hmm. these, these, uh, this way of approaching, uh, you know, the conceptual or non-conceptual that, that I'm, I'm, you know, I would like to argue that, mm. that, yeah, that poetry does not do this or that. Yeah, I do, yeah. I yeah, so, so that's, you know, it's a kind of just, a, just an opening up of, of, of the question. What if, you know, what if, uh, you know, sense and nonsense are, you know, not, do not apply as they have been, um, these concepts have been applied, you know, if, what else is there, in other words, what did, other possibilities are there, and so, uh, my uh, reference to, to Hegel, and the science of logic is that, um, just quickly, in terms of, let's say, philosophy of rapture, that, that this very, very precise language holds within itself a kind of rapture. Uh, and uh, so then I would, I would suggest that, you know, that, that um, it that uh, you know this reference to a pure knowledge or to pure thinking is, <coughs> is you know not necessarily a kind of uh, opposition uh, or um, that. It's, it's, it's a very kind of extreme form of trance also, you know, this, this kind of uh, evocation of, of knowledge. I wonder if it has anything to do with images, mental images, or, or just the way images are present in the world? Um, not concept, the concept would be in a sense distinct. For an image, but images have a habit of affirming whatever it is that they're affirming, unlike concepts, which can affirm, but I think also have a, um, a stronger ability to uh, critique. Um, but there seems to be 
something about images once they become images of you know, minds or you know, in our environment that um, that the line critique and become present and that presencing becomes affirmation. <coughs> As opposed to language, uh, I mean, language can use you know you can consider poetic language as yeah. perhaps being images you know at, like an image as you know in opposed to a concept let's say, um, but I, I suppose it's the aesthetic component of it that that is related to the image. I'm not sure. I mean, you know, in that sense, um, we could talk about a um, form of the abstraction um, in language of thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that Which, you know, Hegel makes some reference between a difference between picture thinking, mm -hmm. you know, pure thinking going beyond understanding, so there's all these, this, this hierarchy, you know. What is more grounded or less grounded? Or and picture thinking would be less of a hierarchy for Hegel. Is that what you're well, um, saying? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it leads towards, you know, absolute knowledge, yeah. but it, it's not at the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, I think we should definitely expand upon that question. I mean, and also we can talk about um, abstract art. You know, if that if it functions in that sense, if if a painting by Mark Rothko or functions on this, you know, sort of pure thinking level. Um, Mm -hmm. A Barnett Newman. Yeah, a Barnett Newman, right. Mm -hmm. to maybe to get a sense of thinking about these, these two modes of, of thinking. Or, uh, mm. But, uh, yeah, I mean, let's... Um, you know, I would, does that answer your question or? No. <laughs> I'm not sure I was expecting an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit uh, suspect, you know, of um, Although, you know, with the images, it's a little bit different, different, different than the language because uh, in language there's not the, the, the non-reference of the signifier and the signified, where, you know, um, that's an issue, um, but in an image of, you know, of something, of a house, a painted house or a photograph of a house, or, you know. Yes. There's a stronger connection there that the, the reference is, is, is you know closer tied to the referent. Mm -hmm. so that might be something in relation to that. Um, but uh, as somebody had mentioned, you know, when I was just uh, talking about uh, well, uh, this the. Uh, Susan Sontag and the erotics of art and uh, so on and, and um, definitely um, Andy Kumantel <coughs> was just mentioned. Uh, I think it's a, a kind of step, it's, you know, her text lined date. Some of you might have read. And um, also in fighting theory, Abita Bonnel also makes references to French philosophy and, and the pleasure of the text and uh, you know, this, this, this form of 
sensuality and, and writing and so on. Um, so I think those are interesting elements um, or, or uh, pointers uh, in also discussing uh, uh, references to seduction and philosophy and to the trans in terms of Catherine uh, Clement uh, philosophy of the trans and cope um, which aligns itself nicely as well with some of what Kristeva is, is writing about and uh, so uh, what I will do is um, I will um, also, I wanted to make some references to sort of plurality and duplicity that I mentioned before. Um, and when we get to uh, Hegel tomorrow, we'll also talk about uh, sublation and sus suspension, words that carry more than one meaning. And this is one of the ways that I'd like to argue or I'd like to consider this idea of philosophy as fiction. That language is capable, of course, of holding more than one meaning. So that, that I would argue that, that the philosophic text inherently, inherently and always already holds within it a, fi a fictional element. Whether you're really interested in, you know, uh, reading it as such or not, uh, it is a kind of double inscription already. So the fact that in Radical Inspiration in our seminar we are focusing on this element is, is uh, that's not to deny that, that um, that, that the fictional element, it, I'm not saying that, that, uh, that philosophy is only fiction, right? But that it inherently holds that, and falls in it of itself. So, uh, just as uh, all these discourses, the master and the slave and the academic discourse and uh, the idea of the lover's discourse. Um, the, the, they're all already enfolded in, in these texts. They're all already there in philosophy. It's just how you approach them as a philosopher, and as a writer and as a reader. 